Bighorn Sheep Disease Update. Dr. Perry Wolf, Chief of Game, Larry Gilbertson. And uh, the comment was that you win the best tie award, sir. <laughs> Elmer. Not uh, you. Elmer. Not you. Elmer. Yeah. <laughs> best, best tie. You win the best tie award. That was a, that was a motion from the commission that you, a new award we're giving out this year. <laughs> I was going to ask you where you got it. <laughs> All right. I'm, so, I'm very sorry. Larry, go ahead. That's fine. For the record, Larry Gilbertson, Department of Wildlife. Mr. Chairman, um, well, actually, it's not very good news. Uh, since the last commission meeting, uh, I have a report from Caleb McAdoo, our biologist out in uh, Area 10. He reports that two of our collared sheep, one in the East Humboldts and one in the Rubies, have died since the last report I gave you. Uh, the Ruby sheep seems to have died sometime in September in Echo Canyon, and it appears that the East Humboldt sheep died in October near Angel Lake. And now uh, the best assessment is that there are 15 known sheep in the East Humboldts uh, based on sportsmen's observations and our observations put together, put them all together and try to figure it out. And there's 15 known sheep there, 101. And then in Unit 102, there are 17 known sheep there. And some of the sheep still seem to be showing some outward signs of illness. And at the last commission meeting, uh, I believe there were some specific questions about this disease event and the, some of the disease agents. And so Dr. Perry Wolf, our wildlife staff veterinarian, is here today if you guys have some specific questions about the die-off. Excellent. Do we have any questions for Mr. Gilbertson before we move on to, uh, go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Larry, just quickly, um, any, anything on goats? <coughs> We haven't any got any or? reports of sick goats, to my knowledge, lately. So, I'd just like to ask a veterinarian. Okay, we'll have her up, and then we'll get her. Anything for Mr. Gilbertson? Go ahead, uh, uh, Mr. Gilbertson. That the remaining sheep you're talking about is out of an estimated herd of about what 300 for the two areas. If I'm not mistaken, our last estimate in 2009, before the disease event. I believe it was 180 in the unit 101 and 160 in 102, if I recall. Wow. So yeah, it's 90% plus mortality. It's, this is it's worse not than good. the one in 96. Then. Yep, it's not looking good. Okay, any further questions for Mr. Gilbertson before we get with our expert? Okay. Welcome, thank you for coming. Sure. So, um, I know talked the past, what have you been able to identify in the exact cause of death? Uh, you go into that a little bit for us. We did, um, we, as you know, that there were nine, actually nine individual die-offs in five western states this winter, including the ones in Nevada, and all of the states pretty much sent all, we sent all of our data up to Washington Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory, and they did some very extensive testing <clears throat> what they found and what we found specifically was there were a number of different organisms. The Pastorella family is kind of the big bad bacteria that causes shipping fever pneumonia in cattle and sheep and, and also uh, is colonized in all of the ruminants lives back in their pharyngeal area and that's when you have any type of pneumonia in ruminants it's usually the Pastorella that are the ones that cause it. So what they did, <clears throat> some of the new technology that they did this year, not only did they, we culture um, the pharyngeal area, the back of the throat on any of the live animals that we collared. We also did a nasal <coughs> swab looking for another type of bacteria called mycoplasma. And then on any of the sheep that then perished, some that we had already collared and others that we were able to pick up um, sometimes we only had the heads, sometimes we had lung tissue that was in pretty good shape. We also went through, and there were a few animals, uh, two animals that we specifically harvested because I felt that they were in such severe respiratory distress that it was fairly inhumane um, to, to leave them on the landscape and also it was an opportunity to get some really fresh tissue and get a good idea. So we found mainly uh, Pastorella uh, trehalosi. Uh, which has been found before and we know colonizes the back of their throats. 
we found Mannheimia hemolytica, which has consistently been shown across all species of dom ruminants, domestic and, and wildlife, to cause pneumonia. We found a small amount of Pastorella multocida, which is another Pastorella species that, we, that is found normally in the back of the throats of many different animals. And then the other thing that we found um, through uh, nasal swabs and also doing some lung cultures is a, a bacteria called Mycoplasma ovinomoniae, which is kind of, it's not been shown on its own to cause death, but what it does is when it gets into the respiratory tract of ruminants, it causes all the little cilia that are in the back of your, in your trachea and in your respiratory tract that are constantly pushing bacteria up in all of us all the time. And what it does is it paralyzes those little cilia and allows the other organisms to kind of, and itself, to kind of move down into the lungs where it causes a lot of damage. One of the interesting things that they did with some of the research up at, um, at <coughs> Waddle was that they were able to, they found that Pastorella trehalosi is a very aggressive bacteria in its growth pattern. So one of the problems that's occurred throughout the whole history of this whole bighorn pneumonia issue is the fact that we know that, past, that Mannheimia hemolytica is a killer. It kills domestic animals, it can kill bighorn sheep, and bighorn sheep are ex extremely sensitive to it. But what they couldn't understand is when they went and, and cultured the lung tissue of these animals that had died with horrible pneumonia, they weren't consistently picking up Mannheimia hemolytica, even though they knew that that was the one that actually was ki probably killing the animals. So what they found is that they theorized that perhaps Pastorella trehalosi, which they were culturing a lot, maybe outcompetes. And they did do a pretty nice experiment where they actually found that when you just culture them separately on their own little plates, that the Pastorella trehalosi continues to grow and starts logarithmically getting higher, whereas the Mannheimia hemolytica kind of grows and then it kind of dies off on its own. So what they found when they cultured them together is that if they, if they look at these culture plates much past six hours, they can't, if they have a really hard time finding the Mannheimia hemolytica because the Pastorella trellosi kind of, you know, it's kind of like where's Waldo? You know, they can't, they can't find it out on the, on the plate. So what they did with our animals, the, animal, the lung tissue that we had from our animals and also from Washington because they had, they actually went and did a, a controlled kill and so they had like 50 fresh bighorn sheep and, and some of the lung tissue we set up. They went back and they, they cultured the lung. They got Mannheimia hemolytica on a small percentage of them and they got Pastorella trehalosi and some Pastorella multocida on all the rest of the lungs. And then they took that lung tissue and they did a DNA probe and they looked at that for evidence that the Mannheimia hemolytica had been there. And on 100% of the lungs, even though they didn't culture the Mannheimia hemolytica, there was DNA evidence in the lung tissue that actually the Mannheimia hemolytica had been there. So again, it just goes to, su it supports that in these cases what we think is happening is that there becomes a, a strain of, of Mannheimia hemolytica that is actually what's probably going in and causing the death of the animals. And there is a number of other factors like this mycoplasma that may weaken their immune system enough that allows the bacteria to go down in and colonize. And one of the things that we think happened in our die-off because of the fact that it went from probably mid-December and is still going on now is that <clears throat> the Mannheimia hemolytica strains that we have, and again, they went back and, and pretty much proved this theory, have low leukotoxin activity. And what leukotoxin activity means is that in order for these bacteria to actually end up killing the animal, what they do is that they go in and they raise a big alarm and all the white blood cells from the animal come running in and then they kill the white blood cells. And as the white blood cells die, they create so much damage to the lung that, that that's actually what's, as much as the bacteria themselves, it's the damage from the dying white blood cells that is causing the, the respiratory tract to fill with fluid and, and the animal to just basically collapse and die. And these Mannheimia hemolytica 
and all of the Pasteurella have leukotoxins. Some have really nasty leukotoxins. Some have leukotoxins that are not that bad. They've done studies that find out that bighorn sheep, as compared to domestic sheep, don't have as much antibodies to fight leukotoxins. They just don't. I mean, they've, they've looked at the colostrum so that, that when the moms and the babies nurse, they don't pass it along. And also just taking animals, random animals, and just looking at them, their antibody levels are just not the same. So that's one of the reasons why these bighorn sheep are so susceptible to these leukotoxins. But what we found out is when we looked at the leukotoxin activity of the Mannheimia hemolyticus that they pulled out of our Nevada bighorn sheep that died, they all had pretty low leukotoxin activity. And I believe that that is one of the reasons why this has been not a die-off that occurred in a week or two, but a die-off that's gone on and on and on because the animals kind of developed a chronic pneumonia got run down, maybe finally some, you know, the other back, other pastorella came up and eventually kind of killed the animals. They've looked at some of these really hot strains of Mannheimia hemolytica where they put them experimentally into bighorn sheep and they've died in 48 hours. But, and those are Mannheimia hemolytica that have high leukotoxin activity. So ours had low leukotoxin activity, was kind of a long, slow burnout. Our major bacteria that we found were Pasteurella trehalosi, which did not, it can have leukotoxin activity, but in usually in bighorn sheep it's found to generally have fairly low leukotoxin activity. And indeed, the, the Pasteurella trehalosi that they got out of our Nevada sheep had low leukotoxin activity. Um, we did not have a lot of Pasteurella maltosida. Uh, Montana had a lot of Pasteurella maltosida, which is another bacteria that can cause pneumonia in ruminants, but we didn't. And then all of the animals that we actually tested were positive for mycoplasma ova pneumoniae. So the theory is, is that's probably they contracted mycoplasma ova pneumoniae, developed, um, which allowed these kind of low-level Pasteurella bacteria to get down into the respiratory tract and kind of create this slow burn effect. So that's that's sort of a summary of what happened um, with, with our sheep and actually some of the research that's been done that they're doing at Waddle and they're continuing to do at Waddle pretty much bears out that, that sequence of events. A uh, uh, couple questions. I mean, I think you stated it, but this is all bacterial. That's what you're saying. There's no viral, no, not much evidence viral? We've looked, we looked for, there's three viruses that we look for mm -hmm. that are, um, again, part of this shipping fever pneumonia complex, mm -hmm. uh, bovine respiratory syncytial virus, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, and parainfluenza 3. And we looked, we, we found some titers, and when we look at our sheep across all of Nevada, we, we realize that there are probably some circulating respiratory viruses in some of our sheep. When we went back and actually tried to find it, uh, find the actual organism because the titer just means that they've been exposed to it. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're currently infected with it. And when we did go back and look at a number of them, we could not sp specifically find. We looked uh, specifically for PI3. So at this point in time, you, don't, you think it's all, it's all bacterial? The we think that the, and the, the, yes, I believe that it's bacterial in conjunction with mycoplasma as something that helps set them up. Have you been able to make a determination as to the source of the bacteria, or is this something no. they've had all along and it just sprout? We don't. One of the things with that, with the Ruby and the East Humble herd, is we don't, we have not historically, or in the, over the last five years or so, handled those sheep. When we, when we go in and do an augmentation or when we're putting collars on, we always are taking samples. We haven't done that with these sheep because we haven't been handling them. So we don't have, I can't tell you what they had the day before the first one got sick. I can't tell you what they had last year um, because we haven't been, we don't have the samples historically on that, on those two particular animals to back them up. You have, um, have now or at some point in the future you're going going to have some uh, suggestions as what can be done to prevent future die-offs? I think that... that big questions. <laughs> no, I mean, 
my personal opinion from listening to the people that are experts on this uh, that do the science in at, and looking at the way these bacteria interact and the way that that I believe that bighorn sheep are just they evolved uh, they did not evolve with another um, Ovid on the landscape so it's not surprising that they they uh, evolved to not be able to handle these they're just a different beast um, and I think the, the recommendation from the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and from the US Animal Health Association um, from both agriculture veterinarians and wildlife veterinarians is maintain separation between domestic sheep and and bighorn sheep certainly that there there's been die-offs in bighorn sheep where they have not been and not only sheep goats domestic goats too because goats can carry similar types of bacteria um, there certainly has been some die small die-offs uh, that have occurred but they haven't been these all age die-offs that have occurred when they're associated with domestic sheep so right. I think separation is the way to go I've had enough questions mr. Hall uh, at the Clark County CAP meeting, there was some <coughs> talk about the fact that it was uh, irrefutable that it was uh, domestic sheep caused this. That's not true. I'm glad to hear you say that. Now, another thing is uh, when you say separation, what, what would be your, how many miles? You know, there there is the million dollar question. <laughs> in the there was, and it's it's hard to say without kind of getting into a little bit more science that was done. In in one of the recent landmark studies that was done, they held uh, the where they took radio labeled Mannheimia hemolytica and put it into domestic sheep, and then so that it would fluoresce. It, it, they could get that particular strain back out and, and know that it was that because they marked it with a fluorescent um, marker. And then they had, they had uh, domestic sheep and bighorn sheep that were separated by 10 meters and they left them there for a month. And then they let them have fence line contact for 60 days. And at the end of that, and then they commingled co -mingled them. During that fence line contact period, they found that three of the bighorn, out of five of the bighorn sheep, developed, were able, they were able to find this radio labeled Mannheimia hemolytica in these sheep. So they know that there had been um, transmission of Mannheimia hemolytica over from the domestic sheep to the bighorn sheep. And then they, one of the sheep was acting sick before they commingled them, and then fairly quickly after they commingled them, um, all of them got sick. Uh, three of them died, and I think they ended up euthanizing the other animals. So I think that you can say that if you kept them apart by 10 meters, that might be okay. But fence line contact is, you know, which would allow nose to nose, is too much. The other difficult thing is, is that they have done some controlled studies, not field, you know, go out in the middle of a hot Nevada or cold summer or cold Nevada winter, and they've been able to get some of these pasturella because it, it's in their nasal secretion. So, you know, the, these, when these sheep always have kind of a moist nose and when they're grazing and things like that, they have been able to culture them off of grass and also out of water sources. So there's never been a solid study to say, okay, if we put you know, if a sick sheep drinks out of this and then we culture it every day for 20 days after two and a half days, it's no longer effective. So there's that, you know, is there transmission on the landscape in the form of grass or water? We know it can occur. We know that they can culture it out of that in controlled situations and barns and things like that. But, and we know that for a month at 30 meters, they did not develop any type of noticeable illness. All right, Mr. McBeth and then Mr. Vogler. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I think I need to clarify something. I was at the CAB meeting in Clark County and I, I don't think there was any linkage between the discussion you just had and the herd in, in the Rubies uh, or the Humboldts. Uh, we were just basically discussing the email that we had received from the department that had this study uh, with regard to the 
um, you know, basically confirming the transmission of uh, uh, the Manhamia hemolytica to, you know, from domestic sheep to uh, to wild sheep, you know, right. based on the contact at the fence line. Right. Uh, and uh, and because uh, and and maybe uh, Commissioner Vogler can speak to this because I think that's been a bone of contention with uh, livestock stock operators and and so you know maybe maybe Commissioner Vogler can speak to that issue. Uh, I don't know which one is on the hottest seat. But how are you today? <laughs> um, we've identified that all undulants have this, you know, I mean, it's sort of like the barn door's already open. So why do we want to slam the head on any of the animals that have already escaped? Is If you stated, if I understand your comments, that these are present in some degree in cattle, sheep, horses, uh, elk, deer, goats, whatever. Is that correct? The family is. The family is. But there are certainly strains because as you, if you've been, and I know you've been following the whole sheep <laughs> thing for your whole career, <laughs> but there are biotypes and strains and you know there's I mean when they looked at the Manheimia hemolytica in this specific study that was done at Waddle they couldn't serotype it out with anything that they had had and these people have been doing this for 20 years and they didn't have the right strain so there are specifically strains that are, you're going to find much more frequently in cattle versus sheep versus goats, that sort of thing. And then within those, each of these little back to these little sub strains or bio groups or, or serotypes or whatever. So it's it, I'm just saying that It kind of reminds me of, of uh, mm. they used to try and use blue tongue as a tool. And there's like twenty three or twenty five different strains of blue tongue. And yes, domestic sheep and wild sheep come down with it and, it and usually of all things they die of pneumonia because they get so stressed out with the blue tongue that <clears> they <throat> ultimately die of pneumonia. Well it causes leaking in the blood vessels. That too. Yeah. But, I mean, I, but I think that the bottom uh, line, the bottom line for me that is, is to me is black and white is that domestic sheep and bighorn sheep are just different and the to me, the Swedes and, and African Americans are different. Right, yeah. and, the, and and they also have different. There are different diseases that are affect different races of humans in different ways. Smallpox was used against my people. So that is why. So I think that is why I advocate that the best thing for them is to keep them separate. Okay. Now that makes now, it hard. Now we're on the same. <laughs> well, no, it does. <laughs> We don't have the same sheep that we had 50 years ago when we had a million sheep in this state. Mm -hmm. We have 70,000 sheep. Mm -hmm. There has to be somebody do some study on risk management. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and, and we're not able to control predators as handily as we could with the toxicants. Right. So now we have guard dogs. Mm -hmm. I only know of one wild sheep that had no fear of a guard dog. And right. that was my old buddy that got shot. He'd come right down and eat salt with them. Now, Whatever made his life worth living for seven years when we were in his area, he ate salt, selenium salt, because we have white muscle disease in domestic sheep because we're very low in it. <coughs> and I don't think he knew what he was eating other than he wanted the salt. Right. Uh, the herder could put his hand out and he would almost reach in his hand mm -hmm. to get salt. The ewes and lambs that showed up later would not come into the band. Mm -hmm. He would. He'd duck his head just like a domestic sheep. Mm -hmm. And he'd whip one of those white dogs before. Right. So you've got a different set of sheep out there too. So I'm talking about risk assessment. I want to go bighorn sheep hunt. I want to I, I hope I live long <coughs> enough to get another Nelson Desert Big or another California whatever. So if thirty feet is the acid test and we have to run our sheep different because of predation. I mean they used to turn the sheep loose in lots of places and then gather them up like cows in the fall. Maybe that was a different situation. But there is, is there anything anecdotal since 1550 when the first domestic sheep were introduced in the southwest where the Nelson Bighorn sheep were at until about 1850 
when we had protein meat hunting on the tops of every one of these mountains to feed the miners. And didn't we narrow the genetic diversity of these animals so much that they're all first cousins? That's not what the genetics seems to be telling us. The genetics says that there's a great diversity <laughs> in, 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 in all the sheep. I don't know about, well, I would have to talk to but, some of the but folks wouldn't it about have a fa Wouldn't it be a factor that, that a lack of heterosis wouldn't have anything to do with disease control? Uh, I don't, no, I mean, minerals? You know, a lot of our, our reintroduced sheep come from Canada, where they're, it's totally what different. About the, Some were already here. I was told that the ones that died off on the East Humboldt were low in selenium. Would that have no, any that's, effect No, they were not consistently low in selenium. Consistently, some, but there were some. Uh, no, some were, some were, some were normal. And, um, you know, we are definitely, I mean, part of what we're trying to do is, you know, shipping fever pneumonia is a multifactorial thing. We know that, that bighorn sheep respond to a lot of these bacteria very differently than domestic sheep. We also know that there are plenty of other factors that affect immune status. So the part, and those are, a lot of those things unfortunately are out of our, our control. I mean, it's just the way the West is, you know. Does so, a domestic sheep have to be shedding these bacteria? If they're present in all these animals, does that animal have to be sick? Because I promise you, there's no money in running sick sheep. And we have men with them that have <laughs> antibiotics to prevent sickness. It's but, not 100%, but right. again, I'm back to risk management. Right. I want to go hunting, right. and I want to bury this hatchet. Right. I want to go on. Right. This part of me over here, but I also got to I got to feed the kids and send the kids right. to college. Right. Right. So we got seventy thousand sheep in the whole state of Nevada. Right. Well, why not if we concentrated on getting seventy thousand wild sheep, and then if we had a die off of uh, even ninety percent, we still have six thousand three hundred left to start over with. They're not all going to die the same day. <clears throat> They're not all going to die on the same mountain. I, I mean, there has to be another solution than just saying. Domestic sheep, domestic sheep, domestic sheep. It's a broken record. Well, I don't think it's saying that domestic. I think that the solution is 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 there a way to have wild sheep on the mountain and look at where domestic sheep go and try to keep a, a degree of separation. And there is, and then I think where you need to do risk assessment is the, sh the domestic sheep experts and the wild sheep experts need to sit at the same table. Put their leave their egos and everything behind and say when did they when is the greatest chance of risk going to occur with the greatest risk of contact and how can we minimize that if we can't minimize it then the best thing to do is maybe we don't put sheep there if we could minimize it by okay if we know that we're having a specific year and sheep are moving our sheep are moving down out of the mountain because of green up and your sheep are moving up the mountain because of green up then maybe we need to interfere. If our sheep are moving in and we see our sheep commingling, then we need to get out there and take out our sheep. If we see your sheep coming into our sheep where they're not supposed to be, maybe we need to take them out right away. But those are all heated discussions, but I think it's but I think that you're right. We can't just say, I hate you, I hate you. We have to sit down and try to work it out. And we also need some other minds besides what are in this room, people that are experts in risk management and you know I hate to say it but sometimes you know they have to get together and just run the numbers and run the look at the history and yeah. run a model and see if this is can and, be done. And those sheep came from the rubies according to, <coughs> to the, the I was told that the sheep that they shot off of the antelopes came from the rubies. I don't know where the ewes and lambs came from. I don't what I'm not sure what you're referring to. Well the, the ram that they shot that my domestic sheep had shared salt with and shared uh -huh. when he was in the area, mm -hmm. I was told that he came from the Ruby Mountains, mm -hmm. which I would don't be know. air miles would be like 80 miles. Okay. I don't um, know his... And he showed up down there, and then uh, he was showed up in about 2002, and then the ewes and lambs started showing up in 2005. And they had a minimal amount of commingling, probably for a three-week period when we were going by, uh, Mike's, there's half a dozen guys that needed to got pictures with the with the ewes and the rams in the picture with the men. They were so tame. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it, to me it seemed like a perfect group of sheep to be studying rather than destroying because <laughs> somehow they, <clears throat> with a minimum of commingling. I'm not saying that my sheep couldn't have been shedding pneumonia. 
but for whatever reason, they when we take the ewes away from those salt grounds, those ewes and lambs would come in and eat that salt. Mm -hmm. They know they didn't stay with us all summer. No, they didn't bed together, but they would come in. And how much closer can you get than eating salt off of a rock? Mm -hmm. I would have loved to have known why they survived, <laughs> and the and the, and the and the ones on the east humbled and the rubies tipped over because no sheep herder is going to tell you. Mm -hmm. But every one of us has had rams, mm -hmm. ewes, and lambs mm -hmm. mixed with us. Mm -hmm. In every mountain range, whether it's Mount Wheeler or where it's at, it happens. They come by, but they don't necessarily tip over. But then with the weather stress or whatever, the mm -hmm. moon and stars lined up, this time on the Humboldts, we had a tip over. Mm -hmm. So rather than pointing at each other, we got to get together, or we're mm -hmm. not going to get to do either, either one because there's too much money. In, in, in the wild sheep groups, they're going to take us out. And they can because they're all talking now 9 and 10 mile buffer zones. Well, 9 and 10 mile buffer zones in the state of Nevada is mountaintop to mountaintop in lots of places. It's just the, and it doesn't have to be that way. That's, I'm sorry. I have it to know. All right, let's see. Anybody hasn't had comments? So, Mr. Shrum, then we'll go here, move back down here. Let me change the subject. Due to the lateness of the hour, can we possibly move 17B and 17C? tomorrow morning between number 20 and 21 um, um, if we could do a motion to suspend the rules and we need to, check, we need to first check with the department on that but if we finish this item and then maybe we can uh, we'll address that all right all right go ahead we'll address that item immediately follow I, I have a about four questions if you bear with me here. Perry, um, did they, I know it's impractical, do they do any sensitivity studies on that bacteria? I mean, is there anything that, you know, theoretically, I know you can't inoculate sheep, but they do any sense, is there anything that works on here, or is that just a waste of money inoculating it? Well, we we did because of the fact that those, big, those Humboldt sheep were fairly clustered. We did attempt to treat them um, we treated a, a certain percentage with that we could get our hands on with a fairly new um, uh, antibiotic that was developed for treating shipping fever pneumonia in cattle and pigs. And it, when we look back on our numbers, it didn't really, it didn't really make a difference. So one of the and the reason that we chose that particular antibiotic because it's meant to be given as a one-time shot. Um, and supposedly has a approximately a 10-day um, period where the blood <coughs> levels are adequate in cattle. Um, <clears throat> the I think in the past there was a die-off that occurred in Montana, and they brought actually brought those sheep into holding facilities and gave them tetracycline to try to stop it, and it ended up um, they didn't save. I think they saved one animal. I think maybe part of the problem with the sheep is the fact that you have to, the drug can't do everything. The animal's got to do something. And if they have lower antibodies and they're more sensitive to the leukotoxins from the actual bacteria themselves, they, by the time we recognize that they're a sick sheep, and we give them the antibiotic, and this is just my theory, this is not, there's nothing that's been scientifically looked at, they just may not be able to adequately mount a proper antibody response to fight back. So there's, <clears throat> now there's, there's three antibiotics that are specifically made for, um, fairly recent ones that are made for cattle and swine for shipping fever pneumonia. The nice thing about the one that we chose was a small volume. It was fairly thin so that we felt that we could get it through the dart needle because we dart, remote darted a bunch of the animals and also had the longest lasting effect in cattle. But I think as a general <clears throat> injectable preventative or treatment or anything, you almost have to get them to eat it. And part of the problem, again, with sheep and all ruminants is that you have to deal with that fermentation vat, which tends to break down a lot of antibiotics and there's not a lot of effective antibiotics that are out there really didn't specifically. Do any, really take like culture of the pasture and do a sensitivity <coughs> on it with blood auger or something like that? They've done they've done those in the past. I mean there's plenty of them that have been done on on d mainly domestic species because there's so much money in this. 
there's huge money in shipping fever pneumonia research in it but no we didn't specifically do it with this but we know that it didn't do any good another question I had how close were domestic sheep to these yeah. <clears throat> I don't think we know don't know uh, and then when uh, when when can we replant when to save time to replant don't know don't know that one either Okay. Part of the problem is is that the only place that you can get, you know, that you can get Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep right now is from outside of the country. Well, one <coughs> of the ones that, you know, there's a genetic pool, and I think, you know, some of the, the better sheep are from New Mexico if we get them. But would, would, would some, some of the sheep, like from New Mexico and a genetic pool, be a little stronger genetically, uh, bringing them in? You know, I'd, I'd have to, I would have to talk to a geneticist about that. There is so much, the science now has become so specialized that I'd, you know, you'd have to look at the, I mean, versus Canadian sheep, who knows. Okay, okay. Mr. McBeth. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Roger, I, I don't mean to put you back on the hot seat again, <laughs> uh, but I just seem to have heard uh, a discussion that uh, uh, of reconciliation of some of these disputed issues and uh, you know in other words of maybe a realization that we we really do have an issue that we need to deal with between domestic sheep and wild sheep and uh, you know you know and you know her discussion of burying the hatchet and all that that's why why aren't we right now gonna talk about how we take the next step what are we gonna do to effectuate you know they, we have a plan in fact a will gross in the state of nevada have read it and the consternation is is we had a memorandum of understanding with the nevada department of wildlife before there would if there was a mixing of domestic sheep and wild sheep of any like this that both sides would be addressed and both sides would be brought to the table and unfortunately in the case of when I told Mr. Cox the existence of, as his nickname was, Chin Crick Chin, they went out three days later and killed him without even <laughs> discussing it with any of the wool growers or anything else. And so now everybody ran to the corners and, and they're scared to death. We have to come up with some sort of a mechanism if this is what we're going to do. I think the risk management is extremely small and it may happen on a mountain range over time. But if we can get these animals to propagate into hunting populations, and we do have a die off, say in the East Humboldt or even the Rubies, it may not affect the ones in the Granite. It may not affect the ones in the Jacksons. But when you go on the Jackson Mountains and every <coughs> cougar scat you find is full of sheep hair and not domestic sheep, you know, maybe there's other issues that are beating these populations far worse than the incidental running into the last 70,000 sheep that are in the state of Nevada. But when you, when a memorandum of understanding has no weight, I don't know, I, I suggested this morning to Mr. Dixon that maybe if there was some sort of a bonding mechanism. A perfect example is in the Sierra Front, right down the street here. Uh, 25 years ago, Fred Fullstone signed an agreement with the Forest Service, with the Rocky Mountain or whoever was the sheep people in, at that time and said, you this, you can stay over here and we won't bother you and we'll be down here and never the twain shall meet. Well, guess what? The domestics stayed in the same place but the wild sheep expanded. They moved into his territory. Well then as the toxicants and other methods of controlling predators, the only place they had any sheep was on his allotments. So then California came in and said, you got to get out of here, Mr. Fullstone. You're going to kill our sheep. Well, wait a minute. This is the, they were living there somewhat of a coexistence. And so then they, you know, so if, if the wild sheep groups had, if there was some way that, 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 that would protect and, and put some meat, I mean, how do you sue, how do you sue on a contract that you have that says, well, these are federal, you know, the, you, there's no way of putting any teeth into it when there's a consequence. Okay, and and I understand that, and I and and I, I think the uh, I, I think the intent here is to um, uh, is to do something. Yes. Do something that protects the interests of wildlife. The Department of Wildlife's uh, you know uh, uh, duty to uh, you know propagate these sheep. 
at the same time, recognizing your property interest and your right to make a living uh, as a sheep grower. But will the next tool be cows? Will the next tool be elk? See All what right. I'm saying? All right. Um, you know, this is an ideal item to bring up. Uh, you're on the policy committee. Maybe you can come up with something in writing for that policy, next policy committee meeting. And we could have a good, healthy discussion at that point of exact wording to that policy. Uh, I just want something to move. I, I, I agree with you, Mr. Rain. It's very late in the evening. I just would like, to, for the record, for the sportsmen that are in this room, that we don't have horns. We're not evil. We would like to solve this issue and go on just as well as anybody else. But as long as the bomb throwers from both sides continue to throw bombs, we're not going to get anywhere. So if we can come up with a unified policy that is agreeable to both parties, well, I think specifics on that at this moment, uh, that'd be great. Yes. Can I ask Dr. Wolf a question? Uh, go ahead. <clears throat> Maybe we can get. If it's bacterial, is the primary responsible element in this thing, is it possible that um, when you, because we've got perfect habitat for these sheep up there, that I can in good conscience approve uh, a, um, you know, an augmentation of sheep into that area until we have a lot better handle on what's going on than we have now. But is it possible that at the time that we do um, transplant sheep into there, that they could be inoculated? Um, and that there is a possibility of developing uh, inoculation that would protect them or give them something to, you know, stay ahead of the game at the time that they're captured and released. We're not doing that now, I don't think, are we? When, whenever we handle sheep, I always give them um, uh, this one of these three antibiotics that's made for shipping fever pneumonia just yeah. because of the, it covers them for the stress that stress, they've gone yeah. through. And then I also give them a shot of an anti-inflammatory. So it's kind of like after a hard weekend you get to take a couple of Advil. Um, the, they have looked at, there are some pastoral vaccinations that were developed for cattle and they have tried to use those on bighorn sheep without any success. Um, one of the, the thoughts or the dreams of um, one of the researchers is trying to use this Pasteurella trehalosi, which is such an aggressive bacteria, and create a, a low leukotoxin form of that. And hopefully it would be, since it's much more practical to actually inoculate domestic sheep than it would be to inoculate bighorn sheep, is that when bighorn sh or domestic sheep were being are being turned out to maybe see if they could s get the past the low leukotoxin pasteurella trehalosi to outcompete the Mannheimia hemolytica that's living in the back of the throat normally. So then basically you're creating a domestic sheep that does not have any of these Mannheimia hemolytica, which cause no problem in domestic sheep. They're very they're they're adapted and evolved to living with them but are what caused the problem in, in big ones. So I'll that's, that's future research. Right now. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I, got, I got a suggestion. I think we ought to take some, uh, a few wild sheep control study and mix them with Hank sheep for a couple of years and let's see if they die. You already have that. They might live. But I won't tell you where they're at. And if they're I'm still living. The rest of them. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, but do you it. You write me a check and I'll make sure that study gets done. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, you know, if they, they, they the wrong might side of this table now, <laughs> they might survive. Yeah. All right. That's all right. Um, if, uh, you know, if there was ever a good use of funding for wild sheep groups, that might be it. I mean, you know, that might. Uh, such thing might be the solution to all of our problems. Right. Um, we'll see what we can do on on uh, policy committee, um, and we'll have more discussion on that. All right. Now we had Mr. Shrum had a suggestion that was um, first. I'd like to check with staff on that. Is that if we can move items B and C, if Mr. Wasley'd be available tomorrow to do those? Yes, he will be. Okay. So if motion was to suspend the rules. If I heard it right, to move item B and C on to tomorrow's agenda. After where? Between number 20 and number 21. Between 20 and 21. 
That requires a second and a two-thirds majority vote in order to do that. I'll second it. Okay, it's been properly moved and seconded to take items 17. No, suspend the rules. To suspend the rules in order and and in order to take <coughs> items B and C. Number 17. From 17 B and C and place them between items 20 and 21. Does everybody understand the motion? All in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously. I think we can finish up the rest of this. It should be relatively brief. We'll pause on Mr. Bonamici. Is he here? He'll be back in a minute. All right, let's pause on that. Let's go down to E. We'll get back to D in just a moment. Gifts, grants, donations, and bequests. 